This is lecture four of Introduction to Biology 2, and today we'll be discussing phylogenies. Phylogenies, let's break down that word. Phylo means branch, and genies is an alteration of genesis, which means creation. So the literal translation doesn't really do it justice. The study of phylogenetics is a science of reconstructing evolutionary histories. After determining how different types of organisms are evolutionary related, we can create a phy phylogenetic tree. A phylogenetic tree is a visualization of ancestor-descendant relationships through time. The closer together different taxa are represented in a phylogenetic tree, the more closely related they are to each other. We use a combination of comparing DNA among species as well as morphological characteristics. However, fossils are the only record that we have that provide direct evidence of physical morphologies, where those species lived, and when they lived there. Phylogeneticists have specific terminology when discussing the parts of a phylogenetic tree. A branch is a part of a tree that can be traced to the end of the tree all the way back to its base. This re represents how a population has changed through evolutionary time. A node, and you can think of it like a fork in the road, is where two branches diverge. This represents a speciation event where an ancestral species split making two species where just before there was one. A terminal node is represented by the tips of a tree. You can think of them as leaves of a tree. Terminal nodes represent species that are currently living on Earth or ones that have gone extinct. In this phylogenetic tree, all the taxa represented by the terminal nodes are living. You can tell that because they all reach all the way to the right. If a species became extinct, the reach of the branch would not reach all the way to the right and would be cut off somewhere before. Phylogenies are recreated using both morphological and genetic characteristics. There are two different approaches to constructing phylogenetic trees, the phonetic approach and the cladistic approach. I'll elaborate on each approach in the next slides. Phylogenies were originally created by the cladistics approach. In this approach, physical morphologies are compared between taxa and phylogenetic trees are inferred by synapomorphies. Remember, synapomorphies are similarities and characteristics among taxa. Groups of taxa are organized together in a monophyletic groups that share synapomorphic traits. These groups are known as a clade. All taxa in a clade share certain characteristics. So here we have a clade of multicellular organisms. It is a single monophyletic group in which all taxa share a synapomorphy, multicellularity. If we work up the tree, we see that the next defining characteristic is whether it is symmetrical. If it isn't symmetrical, it's considered a periphera or a sponge. All multicellular animals that are not a sponge share a synapomorphy for symmetrical organization. In other words, symmetrical animals form another monophyletic group. Now, is the animal you're describing bilaterally symmetrical like humans or radially symmetrical like, well, jellyfish? You say it's bilaterally symmetrical? So that means it can't be a jellyfish. So if you have an animal that isn't a sponge nor a jellyfish, it is in a monophyletic clade with a synapomorphic trait bilateralism. You can work your way up to identify any animal on Earth with this simple cladistic approach. But does it accurately represent evolutionary history? The theory is that the more similar two taxa are morphologically, the more closely related they are genetically. Makes sense, right? And for the most part, this approach works, but it has its challenges. The phonetic approach creates phylogenies based on computed statistics. And those statistics are calculated almost exclusively using DNA. In looking at DNA sequences, the phonetic approach clusters groups of taxa that are more closely similar with respect to their DNA. And DNA sequences among groups that are very different are clumped further away. Several times in evolutionary history, similar physical traits have evolved independently in very different organisms. Well, you might think, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because there are very similar pressures on organisms that live in specific environments. Here we have a classic example. On the top, we have a dolphin. 
Dolphins are mammals. They give birth to live young and nurse those youngs with mammary glands. Yes, mammary glands. So they're actually pretty closely related to humans in that respect. And they're a lot closer related to humans than reptiles, which have scaly skin, lay eggs, and don't nurse their young. Well, lizards have a very close relative, Ichthyosaurus. And this is a dinosaur-era fish-like creature. It had scaly skin, laid eggs, didn't nurse its young. However, if you saw a skeleton of a dolphin and ichthyosaurus, you would likely think that they were close related due to morphological similarities. Well, this isn't the case. There is simply a strong selection pressure for the characteristic that they share. In this case, they both have streamlined bodies, long jaws, and sharp teeth. This is known as homeoplasy. Similar traits not due to ancestry, but evolutionary selection. In contrast, homology is similar traits due to a shared ancestry. Another example of homoplasia is flight. It is very advantageous to take to the air, so much so that it is derived independently of butterflies, birds, and even mammals in the case of the bat. The process which causes homeoplasia is known as convergent evolution. Remember, divergence means to fork. Converge means to come together. They don't do that in a sexual sense, but they do in a morphological sense. So how do you know if two taxa are similar due to homology or homeoplasy? Well, if you find intermediary lineages that have similarities between two disparate groups, you would suspect homology. But if you can't identify any inter intermediary forms between organisms with similar traits, then it is likely due to homeoplasy. This is the case with the bat and the bird. If you suspect homology, you would expect physical similarities between different species, as is the case with mammals. Mammals walk, swim, fly, and grasp. However, at the core, all mammals have the same number and orientations of bones within their limbs. These are clearly homologous. There can also be chromosomal evidence for homology. If you suspect certain taxa are homologous, they should have similarities in their DNA. The Hox gene is an example of this. The Hox gene is a 180 base pair sequence that is ident identical in organisms as different as insects, worms, clams, and humans. This suggests that we all share a common ancestor and that this gene is important for the survival of all these different species. Most phylogenies are constructed using what is known as parsimony. Parsimony is a principle of logic that suggests the pattern with the least amount of change is the most likely one. When constructing phylogenies, parsimony assumes evolution is, in essence, lazy. It takes the easy road. Here we have several shapes. The principle of parsimony would create a phylogenetic tree that looks like this, because shapes that require the least amount of change to go from one to another are more likely closely related. The assumption of parsimony is that homoplasy is rare. Next, we'll see an example where parsimony and the cladistics approach doesn't provide an accurate depiction of reality. Whales are part of a group of organisms collectively known as arteriodactyls, which include hippos, cows, deer, pigs, and other things that generally taste good with ketchup on top of them. They are synapomorphic with the following traits. They have an even number of toes, they walk on hooves, and they have an astragalus. This is a pulley-shaped bone in the ankle of these species that allows them to walk efficiently in a straight line. In case you haven't noticed, cows wouldn't make very good running backs. But whales don't have hooves or an astragalus. So how do they fit into this mix? Well, the answer is obvious. Whales are an outgroup to all these other tasty creatures. They're related, but not a part of that group. Why? Well, they aren't synapomorphic for the astragalus. That makes sense, right? Not so fast, says Dr. Fancy DNA Scientist Guy. In my study of genes, I found that whales share more genes with hippos than any of these other species, so therefore hippos must be closely related to the whales. How can this be? exclaims Dr. Old School Cladistic Scientist Guy. They don't even have an astragalus. Well, Dr. Fancy DNA Scientist explains, See here, Dr. Old School to Cladistic Scientist Guy. Let me learn you something. The evolution of the whale required two changes in the astragalus trait. 
Its ancestor gained a trait that was passed on to all these tasty creatures here. But you see, it had to have been lost when the ancestor of the hippo and the whale diverged. In other words, it is not parsimonious. Fossils are preserved traces of organisms. They provide the only direct evidence of what those organisms look like, where they lived, and when they were there. Fossilization happens when once living organisms gets buried by sediment in a process known as sedimentation. Over millions of years, fossils form. As erosion happens, those fossils are exposed and able to be studied by lucky humans. There are four basic types of fossils. The rarest and most coveted are intact fossils. These are fossils that are basically still dead organisms. They have organic material. Michael Crichton even extracted dinosaur DNA and scared the dickens out of us all with it. They are typically formed by the solidification of pine pitch forming amber. Compression fossils is where sediment compresses an organism and preserves the shape and texture of it. These are the most common types of fossils in which plants are preserved. Cast fossils are formed a lot like a bronze statue. A mold is made by a sculptor. That mold is used to create a negative known as a cast. Then molten bronze is inserted into the cast to make a reverse negative of the statue. Cast fossils are made basically the same way. They can include bones, burrow holes, or even the bark of trees. Permineralized fossils form when minerals infiltrate cells and replace organic chemicals. Since minerals don't decompose like organic minerals, they exist in the geologic record for very long times. Petrified wood is a great example of this. Fossilization is extremely rare. In fact, it's thought to only happen once for every 200 million organisms. Well, there are 300 million Americans today, so you can see how rare it is. In fact, we only have 10 specimens of the bird-like dinosaur, Archaeopteryx. All of our direct evidence that birds came from dinosaurs is based on these 10 specimens. There's also a habitat bias. As fossilization requires sedimentation, Areas with high sedimentation have higher chance of fossilizing, so marine and lake environments have much higher numbers of fossils than highly eroded environments like deserts. Also, fossilization requires little to no decomposition, so tropical rainforests have literally no fossils, because when something dies, it is decomposed very, very quickly. Even a huge tree in the tropical rainforest can be completely decomposed within a single year. There is also a temporal bias. Geologic processes grind up the crust, so fossils that have been formed more recently are a lot more likely to still be around. And there's an abundance bias. The fossil record represents species that have existed in higher abundances, simply due to the probability of getting fossilized is much greater for the more abundant species.